because they only involve an IgG antibody against uh, those particular cells. That, that was a very good question because I don't want you to think that everything in lupus is type 3. Everything in post streptococcal uh, uh, disease is not type 3 either. For example, post streptococcal disease producing rheumatic fever uh, is uh, a lot of part 2, uh, 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 type 2, and non immune complex. Whereas post streptococcal glomerulonephritis is type 3. So uh, make sure you remember that. When I say, when, when people say lupus, don't. And, it, and the different types of pathology don't think automatically type 3 for everything. It's certainly not true for uh, thrombocytopenia, and it's certainly not true for hemolytic anemia. No, it's type 2. That's a good question. That's a good question. In fact, I never even thought about that before. I never thought that's good. Okay. Remember penicillin rash type 1? And that means it's a hypersensitivity reaction. Penicillin hemolytic anemia type 2. IgG antibody against the, that penicillin group that's attached to the red blood cell membrane. Good. Ah, that was good. There was a really weird question a while back that was very, very uh, weird. They said, Dr. Garner, on my test, the, what's the most common antibody in the United States? Whoa. And I said, whoa, you did? That's the first time I ever heard that. And they had all the common ones down there, that anti-hepatitis A virus, IgG, that's a common one. They had uh, the HIV antibody that was, that was down there. I think they even had epstein barr virus antibody there. Okay, and, it, and uh, but the answer, and I knew it only because I was a pathologist and, and I did blood, blood bank work. They had the antibodies against cytomegalovirus. That was the answer. Everyone in this room has been exposed to CMV at some time in your life. So just about every person in the United States has antibodies against cytomegalovirus, which you thought might have been a cold. When you or something like that, you had a cytomegalovirus. It's that common. It's that common. Okay. Um, so that's the most common antibody in the United States. Do you know at this day and age that the that you're safest from getting HIV from a blood transfusion of all infections? Uh, I called the uh, National Red Cross in Washington D.C. for my facts. So mostly uh, the the facts that you get from people that didn't do that are way lower. They'll say like 1 in 200,000 chance per unit of blood for HIV. That's the one that's usually out there. No, it's 1 in 625,000 per unit of blood chance of getting HIV. In other words, that's very uncommon to get HIV uh, from uh, blood anymore because of the screening mechanisms that they do. They, remember, they do the ELISA test, which is checking for anti-GP120 antibodies. Remember, it's a GP120 antigen that attaches to the helper T cell molecule, CD4 molecule. And so they're measuring that antibody, anti-GP120. But then when they do Western blot, okay, when they do the Western blot assay, they're measuring, they're looking for three or four different antibodies. And they all have to be present before you call it a positive Western blot. So that makes it more specific. And so if you have all those four antibodies and you definitely truly have a true positive the lysis screen and you truly are HIV positive. Okay. So, um, so that's the most common antibody. Now, um, you have about a 1 in uh, 2,000, let's see, I, I, haven't, I haven't really looked at these statistics anymore, so if I'm wrong on any of these things, let me know, all right? All right, here's a trick, here's a trick. What is the most common infection transmitted by uh, blood, blood transfusion. Because you looked it up. Hmm. What? Most people want to say hepatitis C, right? The answer is cytomegalovirus is the most common infection transmitted by blood transfusion. Now, what if I said what's the most common cause of post transfusion hepatitis? That's hepatitis C. You've got a 1 in 3,000 or 3,300 chance per unit of blood for hepatitis C. But the most common overall infection that's transmitted by blood is cytomegalovirus. That kind of proves, doesn't it, uh, that why we would have such a high incidence of antibodies, because everybody has it in their blood. See, our newborns, they always, before they give blood to a newborn, they want to prevent graft versus host reaction. In other words, the uh, donor lymphocytes from attacking the baby. And also, they want to prevent it from getting cytomegalovirus because they have no immune defenses against it. So they usually irradiate the blood 
uh, any blood that a newborn get, gets goes down to radiation, and they radiate it with a certain amount of radiation, purpose of which is to kill all the lymphocytes in it. So there's no way you can get graft versus host reaction with the diarrhea, the rash uh, type of thing, and the jaundice. No way of getting that because you destroy the cells that would normally produce that reaction. Plus, cytomegalovirus lives in the lymphocytes, and so would have destroyed that too. That's why we radiate blood before we give it to newborns. Okay, if I get an accidental needle stick from a patient I know nothing about, what's the most common infection I would get from that? Hepatitis B is in boy. B is in boy. If, and boy, I hope you're not in this situation because there's been a couple students in, the, in these groups that has, this has happened to them. What if you know the patient's HIV and you accidentally stick your finger with a needle that, uh, from blood you just drew out of them, what's your chance of getting HIV positive? One in 300. That's big time. Well, another board question is going to be, what do you do about it? The answer is you go on to therapy just as if you were HIV positive. You go on triple therapy. Two reverse transcriptase inhibitors, one of which is AZT and a protease inhibitor, for six months. And you're getting constant checks. You're actually doing the, uh, the PCR test, looking for the RNA in the virus. They do that. That's the most sensitive test. They're doing the ELISA screens and all that for six months while you're on triple therapy. Okay, that would be one terrible six months, I can assure you, with a 1 in 300 chance of getting HIV positive. In fact, the most common mechanism for medical personnel for getting HIV is an accidental needle stick. That's a, another fact for you. So be very, very careful when you're drawing blood from anybody, but in particular an HIV positive person. Good Lord in heaven, 1 in 300. Whew, that's pretty high. All right, uh, we already did antibodies. They hardly ask anything about transfusion things, you know, uh, but, uh, so I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it, but I'm just going to just say this. Don't transfuse anything into a person unless they have, they're symptomatic from whatever it is they're deficient in. That's the basic rule of thumb. For example, if I have 10 grams of hemoglobin and I have no symptoms whatsoever, don't transfuse me. But if I have 10 grams of hemoglobin, let's say I'm a, I have obstru I'm a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and I'm starting to have angina related to that 10 grams of hemoglobin, okay, transfuse me. So the whole basic thing is, are you symptomatic? Example, let's say you have a 50,000 platelet count, okay? If you're not having epistaxis, you know, on a continual basis or something like that, don't treat them, let them be, okay? But if they were, treat them. That's the basic rule of thumb. Every blood product is dangerous. Every blood product is dangerous. Okay. Because you can get infections from them. Fresh frozen plasma, just want to make a point there. Fresh frozen plasma should never be used as, uh, like, like you would use isotonic saline in raising a patient, patient's blood pressure. If you do that in a hospital, you will be called in front of a committee called the Blood Bank Committee. You could lose your uh, recertification in next year. We never use fresh frozen plasma to expand the patient's plasma volume to raise blood pressure. Use normal saline. It's too expensive. It's too important a component. Plus the fact you run the risk of transmitting disease. You use fresh frozen plasma predominantly for multiple coagulation factor deficiencies. So, for example, DIC that would be perfectly legitimate uh, to give fresh frozen plasma to replace those consumed um, factors. If you had a person that had warfarin. Uh, over anticoagulation, but they were bleeding to death. The answer would not be intramuscular vitamin K because that takes six to eight hours to reverse it. If you have a person that's, uh, that's bleeding to death because they're over anticoagulated on warfarin, your treatment of choice is fresh frozen plasma, immediately you reverse it. What happens if you're bleeding to death on uh, heparin, the overdose on heparin? Protamine sulfate. Okay, that works uh, immediately. So fresh frozen plasma is pretty much limited to the, uh, for the use of, re of uh, multiple factor deficiency, cirrhosis of the liver and your bleeding. They have mul I mean, most factors are made in the liver, so they're, they're deficient in these, most of the factors. And if they're bleeding significantly, fresh frozen plasma would be legitimate. Okay, very important that you know the different uh, transfusion reactions. The most common one actually is allergic. And of course, you would know what the symptoms of that would be. You would get maybe uh, itching, you might get hives. You could potentially even get anaphylaxis related to it. And, of course, that's a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. What it is is that you've got a unit of blood, and in the plasma of that person, they had something to which you were allergic to. Maybe it was penicillin. 
And they, you know, when they asked them, do you on any medication? No, okay? They got your blood and you're allergic to penicillin and you got that patient's blood, okay, you can end up with an allergic reaction. So that's a hit and miss type of thing. You just treat that with Benadryl and antihistamine in most cases. The second most common one is a febrile reaction, and uh, that one is due to uh, HLA antibodies, actually. Uh, the, the patient has HLA antibodies against uh, leukocytes from the donor unit, okay? HLA, HLA antibodies against the donor unit leukocytes, so that when that unit of blood is transfused into me, and there are some white blood cells in it, and I have an anti-HLA antibody against the HLA type on those leukocytes, my antibody will react against it, destroy that cell, release the pyrogens from the neutrophil, cause fever. Now, I'm going to ask you a question because I think this is a great board question. I don't know if it's been asked yet. If I've never been transfused, should I have anti-HLA antibodies against anything? No. Absolutely no. Absolutely no. I've never been transfused, never received any blood from any other human being. I should not have anti-HLA antibodies. So I'm going to ask you a question. This is a great board question. I can just see this question. Who is most at risk for having a febrile reaction with transfusion? A woman. Why? Because she's been pregnant. See, every woman that's given birth to a baby has had a fetal maternal bleed. And so some of your baby's leukocytes got into your bloodstream and you developed anti-HLA antibodies. Of course, they weren't your HLAs. They were your significant other's HLA antibodies. So, so the more pregnancies a woman has, the more anti-HLA antibodies she's going to develop because of her uh, previous pregnancies. That's also true for abortions, spontaneous abortions. You can still get... HLA antibodies from that baby and develop it. So women are way more likely to develop uh, febrile reactions because they're more likely to have anti-HLA antibodies. Does that make sense? I can just see the question. Who's more likely to have a febrile transfusion, you know? And they can say, newborn, okay? They can say, uh, man, okay? They can say, a woman with one pregnancy. They can say, woman with spontaneous abortion. They can say, teenager, never been transfused, I mean, 12 years old, something like that. Well, I would pick the one with the spontaneous abortion because that's a pregnancy and there's a potential for that. See, they can give you risk factors, make you, making you think about immunology. We should not have anti-HLA antibodies in our bloodstream unless we've been exposed to a human being's blood. This is basically that. All right, so that's a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction because that's an IgG antibody, that anti-HLA antibody. So that's type 2, whereas the uh, allergic reaction is type 1. Okay. Now, hemolytic transfusion reactions are um, very rare. I've only seen two when they were in the same person. <laughs> Thank God I had nothing to do with that. Okay, the first one is total stupidity. Okay, and I think you would agree, if I'm blood group A and some idiot hung up blood group B on me, that, that person that hung blood group B on me should be disbarred, dismembered, and whatever. Why? Because they didn't look at the bracelet that was on my wrist, that the blood bank put there. And there's numbers on that bracelet. Okay? It means that you didn't look at it and have another person read the numbers off. You read the numbers. Some person read off the numbers on the bracelet and another person looking at the number that's on that unit and they should match. It meant the person didn't do that. That would be a very stupid person. Can you imagine what would happen if I'm blood group A and I got D blood? Okay? Okay, what antibody do I have? Anti-BY. IgM, guys. And I'm getting B blood. Didn't I say IgM was the most potent complement activator? You want to know how long that red blood cell is going to last? A millisecond. As soon as that red blood cell hits my circulation, IG, my anti-BIGM would attack it. C1 to C9, intravascular hemolysis. There would be anaphylotoxins released. Shock. It would just destroy it and go into shock immediately. Very serious. So that's stupidity. Of course, they call it clerical error on the exam. Okay? No, that's not clerical error. That's just plain dumb stupidity. If I, you always know if I wrote the question, if it said stupidity, that would be me that wrote that question. <laughs> it's one of my favorite words because I use it on myself all the time. I'm my hardest critic. But anyway, fortunately, that doesn't happen that much. 
Okay. The other one is no one's fault, usually. And this is a, a, a type where a person, a patient, has an antibody against an antigen uh, on the red blood cells in the unit. You say, well, that shouldn't be, Dr. Goyer, because you just told us that a major cross-match, uh, if that's compatible, it means that there aren't any antibodies because it was compatible and you did an antibody screen, you just told us, and that was negative. You're right. But unfortunately, uh, some antibodies uh, are not present, you, but you've been exposed to them and you have memory B cells. For example, if I got blood 30 years ago from a car accident, let's say they were anti kill antibodies, which are bad ones, okay? Probably right now, I would have no antibody titers whatsoever. None. Why? Because... Uh, they would have gone away, but I do have memory B cells of the event. But my antibody ties would be way below the sensitivity of an antibody screen. So I could have a normal cross match. I could have a negative antibody screen, but here's what would happen if I got transfused the Kel positive unit. I wouldn't develop them immediately, but my memory B cells, I can just see the memory B cell just sleeping away for 20 years, you know, or 30 years. No, no work. The Maytag sailed me now. And all of a sudden, maybe this, uh, this Kel antigen comes zipping on by. You can see the, I can see the eyes open. Can you? The eyes open and say, I smell something here that I smelled 20 years ago. It's Kel antigen. Okay? And so what would happen is it start dividing, okay, the, uh, the B cell in that germinal follicle. It start dividing and eventually turn into a plasma cell. Okay, which would make anti-Kel IgG antibodies. Now, sometimes that can occur within a few hours. Sometimes it may occur in a week or so. It depends on the antibody. And that's the one they like on boards, the delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction is their favorite, favorite, favorite question. And here's kind of how it'll go. If I had to do it, this is what I would do. I'd say it was a woman postpartum that had a very difficult delivery. She had an abrupt show placenta, let's say, and she was transfused three units of blood. When she left the hospital, she had a hemoglobin of uh, 10. Okay? And uh, she was fine. One week later, she looks in the mirror and sees jaundice. She's feeling a little tired and weak. So she goes to a doctor, and sure enough, she has an unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, and she has a, uh, her hemoglobin is 8. And then I'll say, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? That's all they're going to tell you. So I've joined us, and she has a hemoglobin less than what she was when she left the hospital. They will not tell you dork about the Ducoum's test. If they do, you just should thank God for it. Okay? What they'll do is they'll say, what's the most likely cause? One of the first things they'll put down is halothane. Forget it. <laughs> okay? That takes over a week anyway. Um, uh, another thing I'll try to tell you to get you to believe is hepatitis, like hepatitis C or something. Forget it. That's going to take six to eight weeks before you get that. The answer is it's going to most likely be a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. And they probably would ask you what test would you get, and the answer would be a Kuhn's test. And that would prove it, because then you'd see the antibody coating the patient's red blood cell. So what's the moral of the story? You've been transfused. You have a certain level of hemoglobin. A week later, you have jaundice. And a drop in that hemoglobin, that's a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, period. There isn't anything else that does that. That's a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. I have seen that before. That's no one's fault. Okay. All right. Now the big ones, ABO and RH incompatibility in babies. Okay. ABO incompatibility, RH incompatibility. Let's do the simple one and most common one first. How many are blood group O women? How many are blood group O women? All right. If you have a baby... Okay, you're the ones that will have the problem with ABO incompatibility. Why? Because you already have an antibody that can cross the placenta. Remember I said that old people have anti-AIGM, anti-BIGM, and anti-ABIGG. Normally, normally, I have it, and I've never been pregnant. So I have an AB, anti-ABIGG antibody in my bloodstream. That if I was a placenta, it would cross it and attack an A or a B red blood cell. Yes, yes, yes. And so in ABO incompatibility, the very first pregnancy, you can have a problem. So let's make it one. Mommy's blood group O, negative. Baby's blood group A, negative. Let's make it easy. Okay? Is there an, is there an incompatibility of blood groups? Yes. RH groups? No. Blood groups? Yes. I'm O, 
A, B, Z. I have anti-AD IgG antibody. Right across they go. The A part of my antibody attaches to my baby's A cells. That's an IgG antibody. The baby's macrophages in the spleen will destroy it. Type 2 hypersensitivity. Mild anemia. The unconjugated bilirubin derived from that macrophage is handled by mommy's liver. No problem with chronicterus. No problems with jaundice in the baby. In utero, mommy's liver takes care of it. Baby's born. Okay? They're going to have a mild anemia, and within the first 24 hours, they will develop jaundice. Listen carefully. The most common cause of jaundice in a newborn baby in the first 24 hours is ABO incompatibility. Not physiologic jaundice of the newborn. That starts on day three. That's day three, not day one. That's ABO incompatibility. Now, why did the baby develop jaundice? Simple. The baby's liver system for conjugating isn't as good as an adult's. And it has to handle all that, uh, that, that the, the unconjugated bilirubin on its own now. And so it can't, and so it builds up. To, I've never seen a, uh, an exchange transfusion for ABO incompatibility. I'm sure it could, may be necessary, but they have certain criteria for that. And most of the time, it's very, very benign. You put them under UVB light, and the, thank you, it's about time I got this. Barnes & Noble Cafe. Do they have Starbucks? They've done well better. <laughs> yes. My vibrissi curled. Then I know for sure it's Starbucks coffee. Good. Cream, not milk. It's the only thing I'm going to take. This is my only vice. Starbucks coffee. Otherwise, I live a very simple life. <laughs> Little Honda Civic, nothing expensive, nothing in terms of great, as you could tell with my wardrobe, you know. And usually, except for the sneakers, this is how I dress when I go to work and teach, okay. That's just, I feel like to be comfortable, okay. Pick my nose in front of everybody a lot of times, okay. I'm just not, not big on, the, on, on the pretension, you know. Yeah, there's three seat, three, three piece suits. You should have Jing Brain come in with some lad, leave the room, leave the room, leave the room. That means they really have a, whatever. Okay. Now, they asked on the exam, how does UVB light work? That's an interesting question. I saw it work on my little grandson. He was as yellow as a little canary. In fact, when he cried, he was like, tweet, 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 tweet. I said, hey, I think maybe it's a little bit high. A little uh, joined us here. And so then my, my daughter called up the nurse, and they came over with this light. And they got, had a little rotisserie type of thing. They duct taped the little baby to it. You know, stark naked, put these little things over its eyes, and they kind of turned it nice and slow. And this light went on it like that, and I just watched that yellow disappear. Why? Because UVB light converted the bilirubin in the skin into a dipyrrole, which is water-soluble, it's harmless, and a PDF. So it turns the bilirubin into a dipyrrole which is water soluble, and they pee it out. That's the answer to that particular question. It was amazing how fast it worked. It was really amazing. And they had a nice, even tan. That's the purpose of the rotisserie. Okay, you want to make sure that they have a nice tan there. Okay. Now, uh, a few other things. The anemia is very, very mild to uh, uh, guys, mainly because it's not a very strong uh, antigen. Uh, the... Uh, uh, the uh, well, the antibodies against uh, the blood groups. So not a very, very strong antigen. Doesn't host a very brisk hemolytic anemia. So it's very mild hemolytic anemia. And uh, just a little problems with jaundice. Usually no problem. If they do a uh, Coombs test on the baby's red blood cells, it'll be positive, as you would expect, because you would have some red blood cells covered by the uh, IgG antibody. So the context of what I'm saying is, it's usually always an Omani with a blood group A, or B baby, uh, an A or B baby, okay? And that can be right from the very first pregnancy can have a problem. So it's not like RH sensitization with the first pregnancy, you know, no, no problem. Yeah, any pregnancy, if your blood group O, your baby's A, problem. B, problem. O, no problem. It's just that simple. Now, how about RH incompatibility? Now, that's a problem. That means that you are RH negative, mommy's negative, and baby's RH positive. So let's make it simple. I'm O negative, my baby's O positive. Okay, so we are not ABO incompatible, we're RH incompatible. First pregnancy, okay. I deliver my baby, I don't go to a doctor, I deliver my baby, there's a fetal maternal bleed, 
But some of my, the, the baby's O positive cells got into my bloodstream, not good. I will develop an anti-D antibody against it. Okay, I will show you how you prevent that, but let's say I didn't go to any doctor. So now I'm sensitized. When they say sensitized, it means you've got an antibody against that D antigen. So now I have anti-D. So a year later, I get pregnant again. Okay, I'm O negative. I have anti-D, and my baby again is an o, o positive baby. Is there a problem? Yes. Now there's a problem because that's an IgG antibody, and that will cross the placenta, attach to my baby's D antigen positive cells, and that's a way that, in fact, of all the antigens, the D antigen hosts the worst hemolytic anemia. It's very, very powerful. So the baby's definitely going to be more severely anemic with RH than with ABO incompatibility. Same thing happens, though. Uh, baby's macro macrophages, phagocytosis, there's anemia. There's going to be a lot more bilirubin. Mommy's liver is going to be working a little bit harder. But when the baby's born, the bilirubin levels will be way higher. The anemia will be way worse. Excellent chance, probably 99%, they're going to have to get an exchange transfusion to take all of their blood out. And so the purposes of that is to get rid of all the bilirubin, get rid of all the sensitized RBCs, and also to, you know, transfuse them because they're anemic. So they usually will always have an exchange transfusion. Okay. So remember, the first pregnancy, the baby's not affected. That's when you get sensitized. And in future pregnancies, future pregnancies, the babies are involved. Completely different than ABO incompatibility in that regard. So how do we prevent this? Well, if mommy's, are, if mommy's RH negative, okay, when she comes in, she'll have an antibody screen, negative. Okay, so that's good. Baby, around the uh, uh, 28th week, they're going to give her RH immune globulin as a prophylactic. Okay? What is it? It's anti-D. One question on part two was, he does, well, doesn't that cross the placenta? No. The anti-D comes from women that were sensitized, has been heat treated, and all that stuff. It can't cross the placenta. So it's just staying inside the mommy. What's its purpose? Why do they give it at 28 weeks? Simple. Because oftentimes you can get fetal maternal bleeds before you actually deliver. Or you may get in a car accident or something like that, or fall, and some blood can, baby's blood can get into your circulation, and so you'd have some anti-D uh, uh, antibodies there to sit on those D-positive cells and destroy them so you don't get sensitized. That's probably the reason. Then they give birth to the baby, and they see, is it baby RH positive? Let's say it is, okay? Uh, then they have to do a fly how a Betke test. They take some of mommy's blood, do a special stain, and they can identify the fetal red blood cells, if there are any, in her circulation. They can count them, and they can actually pretty well accurately say, well, it's a, there's 10 mLs of uh, bleed in there, there's 20 mLs of ble bleed. So they actually can determine the amount of the bleed from the baby to the mommy, and then depending on that will depend on how many vials of RH immune globulin you give the mommy again to protect her further. So the anti-D only lasts about three months, you know, from the RH immune globulin. So you've got you to give more at birth if you find the baby's RH positive, and that's how it works. That's, that's all they ask on part one. Part two, they're going to go into how you follow the patient with amniocentesis, delta OD 450s, uh, the, uh, the, the different charts and stuff like that. That's part two. Part one, they're just interested in you know what RH human globulin is and just, uh, just the stuff that we talked about. Now, what if I'm O negative, my baby's A positive? Two problems. We're ABO incompatible and RH incompatible, but is there likely going to be a problem with sensitization? No. Why? I want you to think. I'm O negative, baby is A positive, right? I deliver my baby, okay? Some of her baby's A cells get into my blood. Ooh, how long are they going to last? Oh, about a millisecond, because I'm blood group O. I have anti-A IgM antibodies, and they will destroy those cells so fast and in the majority of cases, not all, they're all gone and there's no opportunity for the mother to develop an antibody against the deantigen because all those cells have been destroyed. So in other words, there's this maxim out there that you hear in the OB you know, literature that ABO compatibility protects against RH sensitization. And that's the mechanism for that. That is not to say that they still wouldn't give RH immunoglobulin. Of course they are, because there are exceptions to every rule. But if you are ABO and RH incompatible, the ABO incompatibility will actually be somewhat protective against getting sensitized because those baby's red blood cells would not last very long in your circulation. Understand? Okay, that's it.
This is what a poor little kid with erythroblastosis fetalis has in RH incompatibility. You want to know what it is, guys, that they die of? Heart failure. Remember, severe anemia decreases the viscosity of blood, right? And so they get a high output failure, left heart failure first, right heart failure second. Actually, we can't do pitting edema, but there would be pitting edema in this patient. And their livers are huge because they have extramedullary hematopoiesis in it because they're so severely anemic. So they basically die of heart failure. That's what erythroblastosis vitalis is. And it's secondary to severe anemia. Look at this, because this was the picture on the boards, guys. I know this because the student said, they showed a cross-section of, 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 uh, of the brain span and, and from a kid. And I said, okay, what were they looking, what were they saying? Well, they wanted to know what was, what was the cause of the color changes. Well, can you see that these are kind of yellowish, right? What do you think this is? It's carnicterous. So is it from a baby that probably had RH incompatibility? Remember, it's an unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, right? Because it's a hemolytic anemia, and, and it relates to unconjugated, which is lipid soluble. Remember, the blood, baby's blood-brain barrier is immature, and so this lipid soluble unconjugated bilirubin gets into the lipid, lipid-rich brain, uh, basal ganglia area and other areas of the midbrain, and it's very toxic, and you end up with severe debilitating disease or death from carnicterus. So this is the exact picture was on board. So if you see a brain, a cross-section of brain, newborn, you see uh, orangey color in it, it's carnicterous, guys. So don't, don't go crazy on it. That's what it is. All right. One cardiovascular. The way I'm going to elect to do the first two or three pages in your notes on physical diagnosis is just do one part of it now, and then when we get to those parts that require an understanding of S3, S4, and heart murmurs, we'll do it then. That way we save a little time rather than reduplicate. My goal is to finish cardiovascular and most, if not all, of respiratory today, and then I'm really, really sitting great uh, for the last two days. Let me tell you what I plan to do on, on the, at the end on Friday. So I have about 75 board quality slides that have been on exams, and I, and I shoot them at you. Okay, and I just, give, I just make up things in my head. And so you get to see, again, all the key pictures, particularly those that have, I know have been on board, you'll see them again. And you'll see it in the context. I will give you little questions, and it's fun. It keeps you, keeps you awake. It takes about an hour. Okay, so my goal is to make sure I have a nice amount of time to do that without having to go over, which I hate to do. So we're doing pretty good so far. Um, We'll hold off on the heart murmurs now. What I want to just go over is jugular venous pulse. I, I know that PASO will do that, but this is important, so I want to make sure, especially since we're going to need it for some of the, uh, the cardiac diseases, you know, giant A wave and stuff like that. Okay, so let's just deal with the jugular venous pulse, and we'll deal with the rest of the physical diagnosis when it comes up. Now, the jugular venous pulse is usually on the, on the right side is where we examine the patient. And the best way of finding out which of the waves it is is to find out when, when the systole occurs, you know, when that first heart sound occurs, and then you can clearly identify the waves. The C wave corresponds with the first heart sound, okay, which is the beginning of systole. And so that's how you can identify that wave at C. So notice there's three positive waves, A, C, and V, and there's two negative waves, X and Y. And here's how it goes, guys. The A wave... It's due to atrial contraction, right atrial contraction in late diastole, late diastole. That's to get that last bit of blood out, you know, uh, uh, to fill up that, that right ventricle. When it does that, that last contraction, a lot of the blood goes into the right ventricle, a little bit backs up into the, the venous pulse, and it creates the positive A wave. So the A wave is due to late atrial contraction of the ventricle, positive wave. Okay. Then we have the C. We have actually the tricuspid valve closes in systole, right? And, and there's a contraction, okay? That's going to, that contraction is going to, and the blood's going to go up the pulmonary artery, and some of it will hit against the tricuspid valve and bulge it in, bulge it out a little bit, bulge it out into the right atrium. Not, not, not that it's incompetent, but it'll bulge a little because blood's going to hit it. And so when it hits it and bulges it, it creates a C wave, which is a positive wave, okay? So you can picture now, in a sense you should almost close your eyes and try to picture this thing, okay? So you know that systole's occurred, 
It's contracted, the tricuspid valve is closed, it bulges out initially, now you can see that blood going right up the pulmonary artery, and that creates a little negative pressure behind it, and it kind of sucks the valve down a little bit, and that's your X-wave. So that kind of negative pressure created by the blood whizzing up into the pulmonary artery, the tricuspid valve kind of gets sucked down a little bit, okay, and it produces the X-wave, which is negative. Okay, now the V-wave, is the, the beginning of the V-wave, is the filling up of the right atrium. You have to fill up the right atrium in, in systole. So they actually, I mean, and, and to fill up the right atrium with blood, that's actually occurring during systole. And so that's what the V wave is, is that your tricuspid valve is still closed, systole is still occurring, blood still going out the pulmonary artery, but your right atrium has to fill up again. And so that's what this V wave is. The right atrium is filled up, tricuspid valve is still closed, and now it's totally full right up there. So the V wave is actually corresponding with the actual beginning of diastole, the S2 heart sound. So it's all filled up the right atrium, then diastole begins, the tricuspid valve opens, blood goes out into the ventricle, that's your Y wave. Better know that cold. Just to see if you did. If I have uh, an irregular, irregular pulse, I have mitral stenosis, which wave has disappeared? A wave, because that's atrial contraction. An atrial, that was atrial fibrillation I described. Very good. Um, all right. If this heart sound was present, and it usually isn't, what heart sound would be absent? S4. Because an S4 heart sound, as we'll find out, relates to atrial contraction against an increased resistance. So you'll have an absent A wave, you'll have, uh, uh, if you have atrial fib, and you'll have, if you had an S4, you'll lose it because that deals with atrial contraction. Those are both S on boards. Let's say you had tricuspid stenosis, and the atrium had to contract against the valve that didn't want to open. And what would happen to the A wave? <whistles> Become huge. That's called a giant A wave. Okay. What if you had tricuspid regurgitation? It didn't close properly. So when systole occurred, a lot of the blood went into the right atrium and some went up the pulmonary artery. Can you see that just filling this whole area up? You get a giant CV wave. So a giant A wave is tricuspid stenosis. A giant CV wave is tricuspid regurgitation. That's all I wanted to point out at this point. Okay, see this little tube of blood up there, or plasma? It was on boards. Should be too, because it's biochemistry. Okay, here we go. When you have turbidity of plasma, you draw blood out and it's turbid. Is that due to triglyceride, or is that due to cholesterol, or both? Triglyceride. Only triglyceride produces turbidity, not cholesterol. That's fact one. Fact two, there's two fractions that carry triglyceride, chylomicrons, and that's from the triglyceride you eat at McDonald's. That saturated fat crap. Anyone that eats at McDonald's got to be crazy. Okay? I've taken some of the hamburger meat and looked at it under the microscope, and I can assure you it's not all beef. <laughs> little spleen, little liver. <laughs> yeah, it ain't all beef. Whatever. Uh, you're eating saturated fat. Those are long-chain fatty acids, guys. And they're being broken down in your, in your gut with the help of lipases and then reassembled in your small intestine and stuck in chylomicrons. Okay? So, chylomicrons are, are exogenously... Oops. <laughs> Some guy on your dress has a hole going right through it right now. <laughs> All right. It's exogenous or diet derived triglyceride. That's why if you go on to get an accurate triglyceride level that's telling you about the patient's real triglyceride level, you must fast. Because if you're not fasting 12 hours, then if you were eating any kind of fatty foods, and that would be in a chylomicrons, that would eat, falsely increase your triglyceride. You don't fast for an accurate cholesterol. You can go to McDonald's if you want, get an HDL, get a cholesterol level right there and then, and it won't be affected by it at all. Why? There's less than 3% cholesterol in chylomicrons. You don't have to fast to get an accurate cholesterol and HDL level. Why not HDL? It's HDL cholesterol we're measuring. But you have to fast to get an accurate triglyceride level because there are going to be chylomicrons in your blood related to the crap that you ate. Ooh. Wonderful board questions that deal with real-life clinical stuff and biochemistry. They love this. That's why they asked us. Now, 
What is it called that the triglyceride that I make? We already did this, guys. It's called VLDL. Very low density lipoprotein is what we make in the liver from glycerol 3 phosphate, which came from glucose. And increased if I'm an alcoholic because of all that NADH pushing it DHAP to glycerol 3 phosphate. Which is more dense, chylomicrons or VLDL? VLDL, because it's got a little protein in it. Chylomicrons hardly have any, so it floats. So you see this supernate here, this kind of white area here with the yellow thing there? This is chylomicrons up here because it floats. You see this kind of pinkish turbidity below? That's called the infranate. That's VLDL. So a simple tube placed in a refrigerator at four degrees overnight can tell what lipid fractions are responsible for your elevated triglyceride. And so this patient, it's a combination of excess chylomicrons, probably because it didn't fast, and an increase in VLDL. Whoa. All right, look at this tube over here and see if you understood what I said. Well, what's the, well, let's look at this one. That's perfectly, perfectly normal. But I'll bet you uh, it, but cholesterol could be elevated in there, but it would produce turbidity. What about this one? How would you interpret this one? High column microns. What about VLDL? None. So if you had to play odds on what this patient did, why this is like this, what would you say? The patient wasn't fasting. You don't honestly think this is type 1 hyperlipoproteinemia in a child, do you? That's as rare as hen's teeth. The chances are this patient didn't fast. And you can tell, because there's chylomicrons there. That'd be the most common cause. What if there was no supernate, but you had a turbid infranate? And it means you have an increase in what? The LDL. Does anyone know what type of, uh, what type of uh, lipid abnormality that is? It's only your most common one. What, what is it? Type 4. Most common hyperlipoproteinemia is type 4, which is an increase in the LDL. And so you would have a turbid infranate, but you would not have any chylomicrons in it. You can see why they can throw this at you, because it's, it's all biochemistry, and we do this in a laboratory all the time. Okay? So we fast to, be, to decrease what? Triglyceride derived from your diet. Do we have to fast to get an accurate cholesterol and HDL? No. Good. Diagnosis, please. Exanth elasma. Exanth means yellow, elasma eyelid. Okay, what's the lipid underneath there causing it to be yellow? Cholesterol. You see somebody with exanthal asthma, you should get a lipid profile. But it won't be triglyceride, it'll be cholesterol. Now look at this one, please, as they're all on boards. This is not a callus in the back of the Achilles tendon. This is an Achilles tendon exanthoma in a patient who has a family history of death by coronary artery disease by 20 years of age. Who am I? I am... Familial hypercholesterolemia, autosomal dominant disease with absent LDL receptor, and that is pathognomonic for that genetic disease, an Achilles tendon exanthoma. So that's type 2 hyperlipoproteinemia. That's one you definitely don't want to have because you have no LDL receptors. So that means all that LDL that's supposed to be going into cells can't go there, and so it builds up. And it's very high, and by 18 you get your first coronary, and usually you're dead very shortly thereafter. Very bad disease. I mean, probably at birth they put you on an HMG CoA reductase inhibitor, because, I mean, they get to keep the cholesterol down. They're also trying to fiddle with gene therapy on this, okay? Uh, trying to figure out what the code is for LDL receptor, and then take that code, make a copy of it, stick it into some virus or something, uh, to put it into the host genome. They tried it already. And it worked a little bit, and then, it's, then it came back again. So they haven't figured that one out. It did with uh, severe combined immunodeficiency. They actually cured somebody with that because they found the code for adenine deam deaminase, that enzyme that's missing. They know what the code was. They copied it. They stuck it in an uh, adenovirus, which is a DNA virus. They stuck it into the genome of that virus. They infected the kid with the adenovirus. And as you know, for the adenovirus to replicate itself, it has to put its DNA into the host DNA, and it did it, and it carried along with it the code for adenine deaminase, and guess what? The kid's alive. Actually cured the kid with severe combined immunodeficiency. That's the, you know, the, uh, the bubble kids, you know, the kids that live in the bubble? You know, they have to live in, uh, uh, because they can't be uh, in contact with air, air contamination. 
Okay, so actually that was the first gene therapy experiment and it worked. And that's on boards too. That's on boards. Okay. You all know what this is. What process is this in this aorta? Come on. Atherosclerosis. Okay, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. All you're going to do, all that's going to happen is I'm going to laugh at you. That's all. I mean, that's not bad. <laughs> okay. What's the reaction to injury theory is considered to be the current theory for how atherosclerosis develops. And basically, it's basically saying what the problem is. Injury. Something's injuring the endothelial cells lining elastic arteries and muscular arteries. That's the only two arter arteries that you see atherosclerosis. Like what's injuring it? Well, let's try some of the components of cigarette smoke. How about ammonia in cigarette smoke? How about carbon monoxide in cigarette smoke? And lots of other horrible things that damage your endothelial cells. So smokers immediately have a risk for atherosclerosis because of poisons that are damaging it. What else? LDL itself damages it. And if it's oxidized, it really damages it. Viral infections do. There's a real one that's coming up here. I believe you're going to see it on your test because it's in the news and all that stuff for the last you know, year or so, year and a half. And that's chlamydia pneumoniae, the second most common cause of atypical pneumonia, the TWAR agent, which I'm sure you came across. And they have clearly documented that patients that have myocardial infarctions most of them had antibodies against that particular virus, chlamydia pneumoniae, and so they're trying to make a relationship of maybe an infection with that atypical chlamydia, and potentially maybe uh, uh, something in it is causing vascular damage and predisposing to atherosclerosis. That's a big one right now, guys, and so potentially that could be it. Not chlamydia trachomatis, chlamydia pneumoniae. It seems to be seroepidemiologic evidence that that might have something to do with coronary artery disease. So chlamydial infections, viral infections, uh, homocysteine, all of these things can damage endothelial cells. So what? Well, what happens when you damage endothelial cells? Platelets stick to it, okay? And uh, so platelets have platelet-derived growth factor in it, and they release that uh, into the uh, artery. And platelet-derived growth factor causes the smooth muscle cells in the uh, media of the vessel to start proliferating. They undergo hyperplasia, and then they chemotactically start migrating like a school of fish to the subintimal level. They move from the media to right underneath the endothelial cell. Okay, so they have all these smooth muscle cells, you know, migrating to right underneath the, uh, the, uh, the intima of the vessel. Of course, monocytes now have access into the uh, vessel because it's been injured. Monocytes have, also have growth factors that do the same thing. And then if you have an increase in LDL, they phagocytize the LDL, the smooth muscle cells do, the macrophages do, and that produces the fatty streak that you see. It's basically macrophages and smooth muscle cells that have LDL in them. And that produces that yellowish disc discoloration. Over time, there's an injury that occurs. There's the release of uh, there's fibroblasts that, that develop in there. And you end up with a fibro fatty plaque, which is the pathic mnemonic lesion of atherosclerosis. And then it can become uh, complicated by dystrophic calcification, fissuring, thrombosis, voila, we have complicated atherosclerosis. Let's break.